the Lenexa Public Market, and today we're talking about hope. Can you tell me what a virtue is? No, I cannot. It's just something you stand, you believe in, right? It's uh, kind of the difference between right and wrong, I think, right? What is hope to you? <laughs> hope is having something to look forward to. Your beard kind of matches my It does. Microphone. Do you what? even see it anymore? What would life be like without hope? Hopeless, lifeless. There's no uh, thing to look forward to, so just lose out point of living. Hello, Westside Family Church. It is so great to see you here, our Speedway campus, those of you watching online. Let me begin by saying this. We cannot cope without hope. We cannot cope without hope. And when we do not have hope in our lives, it affects every aspect of our lives, spiritually, mentally, emotionally, and even physically. Did you know that? The Journal of the American Heart Institute has come out with some remarkable research. People uh, who uh, had high levels of despair had a 20% greater occurrence of the narrowing of their arteries than optimistic people. That is a magnitude of increased risk um, uh, like comparing a, what you see in a one-pack-a-day uh, smoker to a non-smoker. The level of intensity in the narrowing of your arteries when you live without a sense of hope. So I want you to ask yourself the question, just make sort of a mental note. If I ask you the question to rate your sense of hope, the state of your hope right now on a scale of one to 10, be honest with yourself and just say where you might be on a scale of one to 10, your state of hope. I think it's gonna be appropriate today that we tackle this question in light of that. The question is how do I deal with hardships and struggles in life? Anybody interested? Then let's pray, because we have a lot of work to do in the Word. God, thank you so much for the opportunity of standing before these awesome folks, those here, those in the South Sanctuary, our Speedway campus, those that are watching online. We open up your Word today in desperate need of hope, and we just pray that our hearts would be open to receive what you have for us today and that we would take it into our very soul so that we can walk out of this experience today with a, an extra bounce in our step because we have been with you today. We pray all this in the name of Jesus. And everybody said? Amen. A man approached a Little League baseball field one afternoon and he came up to a little boy playing the game and said, uh, how's it going? What's the score? He said, well, it's uh, uh, 18 to nothing. We're behind. And the man said, well, you must be a little discouraged. A little discouraged, the boy said. Why would we be discouraged? We haven't even got up to bat yet. <laughs> I can cope with hope. I can cope with hope. The, I first heard that sentence, those words, from the lips of Dr. J.I. Packard. A number of years ago, uh, when I was working on identifying the 30 biggest ideas found in the Bible that now all these years later have become the scope and sequence curriculum called Believe that we're now doing, Christianity Day was gracious to give me three full days with British legendary theologian Dr. J.I. Packer. And he had written a, a book that really rocked my world in the younger days of preparing for ministry, a book called Knowing God. And so um, uh, I had uh, had the opportunity of getting together with him, and I was young and very intimidated uh, to meet him and to talk with him for a full day. I had sent on my work ahead of uh, our meeting to Dr. Packer for him to take a look at, but I was pretty sure that in his busyness that he would not have time to look at my little old work. So when Dr. Packer walked into the little conference room in Chicago, Illinois, he was carrying a manila folder. And when he sat down and opened the manila folder, there was my work. 
covered in red. My eyes got as big as oranges, and he said to me in, this, in his Coke bottle glasses and British accent, Randy, you've done some really good work here. This is some of the best work I have seen. However, <laughs> if you want my full endorsement, you're going to need to add hope to the list of virtues. And I said, yes, sir. But then I ask him why, and that's when I first heard the words, I can cope with hope. Hope is an essential virtue for our human survival. Hope is an attitude. Hope is an attitude like the boy who is 18 runs down in the first inning, still believing they have a chance to win. Or the line out of Dumber and Dumber, when the guy says to the, the girl says to the guy, you don't have a chance in a million, and his response back was, so you say I have a chance. Yeah. Hope is an attitude for sure, but ultimately hope has to be anchored in something trustworthy. And this is where we get ourselves into trouble, when we place our hope in things that cannot deliver. This is exactly what happened to me and the awareness. I had already, as, at, at 20 years ago, was already a pastor with several degrees in theology. I knew a lot of things, and I was very much a hope-filled person. Anybody who knew me would say that, but many of you know my story. 20 years ago this year, my mom passed away suddenly from pancreatic cancer, and it did a number of things in my soul, and one of them is that it raised the level of despair in my life. And as I probed that a little deeper, I re realized the reason I was experiencing increased despair is because I had placed my hope in my current circumstances. Now listen to me carefully, because I'm pretty sure that many of you are doing that right now. It is a rookie mistake, particularly for a guy that knew better theologically. But I was hope-filled because I was counting on my current circumstances to stay the way that they were. For example, um, I wrote down six things that I was hoping on. Number one, I was counting on staying healthy and never dying. I mean, a lot of us think that way, right? And while at this very moment, I feel healthier today than I did when I was in my earlier 30s, the reality is I've really, I've really probed this. I don't think I'm gonna get out of this thing alive. I mean, there is a lot of evidence that says this is not going to be a sustainable place for hope. A second thing is that my hope was based upon people uh, in my life, staying in my life. And I just lost my mother, and then it dawned on me, this is the beginning of a series of dominoes falling where people that I desperately love are gonna be exiting my life. A third one, I was hoping that I, uh, my hope was based upon my marriage to Roseanne, that we were staying together. And so, so far so good. We're 38 years and counting, and it's awesome. Best marriage ever. Roseanne says we might even make it to 39. <laughs> but the reality is, I mean, I've checked this out, at some point, this arrangement that we have is gonna to come to an end. It's gonna to come to an end, and it just frightens me to death. I, never, I didn't say this in the other services, and it may be a little weird, but I mean, and Roseanne will tell you this the truth, I hold Roseanne at night, like, like seriously, like I'm so grateful that she's still in my life. But I just know at some point, this arrangement that we have is gonna to come to an end. And I pray to God that I'm the one who goes first. I really do, because it's painful. Another place I put my hope is that my four children would stay with me and that they would be okay. And we're years down the road now, 20 years down the road, and my children, at this stage in life, they're okay, you know? And I'm really grateful for that. But the reality is all of them left, and, and, and that's good, you know? But at the same time, though, it really rocked my world. Another thing I placed my hope in is that I would have a job that would not only pay the bills, but it would be a job that I loved. And that's one of the beauties of my life. I know for some of you that's not been your story, but for my story, I place my hope in the fact that I feel really good about the work that I get to do. But I have looked at this thing, and there's just no way 
that I'm going to be able to sustain this forever. At some point, you know, they're going to force retirement on me, you know. At some point, it's going to have to come to an end. And I've seen a number of people, particularly men, that have really struggled with when that came to an end and defining their personal relevance in this world and a lack of hope and despair increases. Another thing that I put my hope in was that the world that I was living in 20 years ago wouldn't possibly, couldn't possibly get any crazier well, it's gotten crazier. And I thought, well, no, no, no worries. That's the world. I live in the greatest country in the world, the United States of America. Certainly, they're not going to let this thing get any crazier. And I have to tell you, there's sometimes I wake up and I don't even know where I am at. In the Believe book, um, we have included a selection of scriptures that list out the many locations of false hope. That is, things that we are placing our hope in that are currently, for many of us, giving us a sense of hope. But the reality is these things are going to, one by one, they're going to fail us and they're going to disappoint us. And if you wait till then, your level of despair is going to rise and your arteries are going to narrow. Let me uh, t- list them out for you. The first one is false hope in riches. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain. False hope in people. Jeremiah chapter 17, cursed is the man who trust, cursed is the one who trusts in man, who draws strength from mere flesh. I love that. False hope in stuff. Habakkuk chapter two, of what value is an idol carved by a craftsman? And finally, false hope in government. Isaiah chapter 31, woe to those who go down to Egypt for help. The Egyptians are mere mortals and not God. So many people I see today are leaning on the government to fix things. Newsflash, they don't have the power to fix these kinds of things. And so then what happens is that many people come to God with the notion that he's going to take all of these things I've just mentioned and he is going to come in and sustain those things in our life. And when those things go away, many people get angry with God. But the reality is God's job is not to manipulate your circumstances so you can continue to put your hope in these things versus putting your hope in him. Back to Dr. Packer for a moment. Um, Because we were working at the time on an assessment tool, I asked Dr. Packer if he could help me uh, craft four assessment statements that people could respond to in relationship to their life to see where they stood against biblical hope. As a matter of fact, those four statements are in your program in the bulletin that we wrote that day in the small conference room in Chicago. And I'll never forget what he said. He said, there are two causes that lead to the effect of hope. There are two causes, biblical causes, that lead to the effect of hope. I'm gonna cover those real quickly. First cause, you believe the promises. You believe the promises. Now, he's talking about believing the promises uttered by the lips of Jesus shared in the Bible, but particularly, he's looking at the promises that have to do with the afterlife or what's next or eternity. For those of you who are here at the beginning of our journey with Believe, uh, we told you that virtue is rooted in your belief system. Who you become, the kind of person you become, is completely tethered to the belief system that exists in your heart. In this case, we are asked to go back to chapter 10, the 10 beliefs, and look at chapter 10, which is our belief in eternity, or what the Bible says our future holds. The notion is, if you truly believe the promises that are contained in the scriptures about eternity for believers, and you yourself are a believer in Jesus, then what's going to happen over time is that a bud of hope is going to appear on the branches of your life. And then if you sustain that position with God and believe, eventually a crop of hope will appear on the tree of your life. Now what I want to do 
is I wanna cover just one of the places where Jesus makes a promise about the future for those who believe in him. It's our key verse. It's in, in John chapter four, verses one through three. Jesus said, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house has many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you may also be where I am. Jesus promised his followers that their story doesn't end here in this life. When our body expires, that's not it. There is more to come. He said he promises for his people that he will come back and take us to be where he is at and he will give us the keys to a residence that will enable us to be in a new city where we will be in the presence of God forever and ever and those who have gone before us. Isn't that amazing? Question is, do you really believe that he's going to pull that off? You do? I mean, what a magnanimous idea. For some of you who weren't so quick to say you believe it, that's okay. Because see, this is what happened to me when my mother died. Uh, I had a rush of doubt appear in me and said, is he really going to do that? Doubt just overcame me, and that's okay. But in order to have hope, you have to believe. And when you actually believe this promise, the Bible teaches that this is a game changer when it comes to the subject of hope. Matter of fact, listen to the words of Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, can I get an amen? Yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day, inwardly. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary and what is unseen is eternal. Of all the things that we put our hope in, as life goes on, they're going to fall off one at a time. And it will be difficult for us, and that's okay. Getting used to what I call the new normal. When those circumstances shift and change, someone moves our cheese. It'll be difficult, but it pales in comparison to what lies ahead. And when you recognize and believe the promise of what lies ahead, you'll be able to put the loss of these circumstances in perspective. And even in the midst of losing them, you will not lose your hope and fall into despair. I speak to you, church, profound truth available to you in Jesus Christ. But for you to have this hope, you have to really, really believe it, not just understand it, but really believe it. I want to take you to Hebrews chapter 11 for just a moment. For those of you who are familiar with the Bible know that this is called the Hall of Faith. It's a list of people who really did believe. It could just as easily have been called the, the Hall of Hope because faith and hope are tied together. I want you to listen to it. <clears throat> now, faith is confidence in what we hope for. This is a group of people who really have the confidence that what they are hoping for is going to actually happen, okay? Now, faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance of what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. All of these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. People who say such things show how they are looking for a country of their own. If they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had the opportunity to return. Instead, they were looking for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. 
This is in reference back to the words of Jesus in John chapter 14. Inside of, uh, outside of the room that he's constructing for us is the city that is under construction even as we speak. Do you believe that? Now the text zeroes in on a character by the name of Abraham and his personal experience with hope. By faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had embraced the promises, there it is, embraced the promises, was about to sacrifice his one and only son, even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead, so in a manner of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from the dead. This was a test of Abraham's belief. Abraham so deeply believed in the promise that God made to Abraham. A couple of promises. One, that he would have a son and that it would be through this son that a great nation would arise and through this nation called Israel, the Messiah would be born from who would provide the way back to God through his sacrifice on the cross. Abraham deeply believed God when he said, it's going to be your son, Isaac, that pulls this off. And he also believed in the promise that God had a future home for him. Even though he never experienced it in this life, he knew it was coming. He believed it deeply. So when God comes to him and says, now, even after I made these promises, I want you to take your son, Isaac, and sacrifice him. And Abraham said, okay. Because he believed that this was on God. That if he took the life of his son, God would somehow have to figure this out because he made a promise through Isaac and about their future home. And he said, even before the resurrection of Jesus, he assumed, I'll take the life of my son, but you're gonna have to do something, God, because it's on you. You must like raise him from the dead. I mean, that is the depth of which Abraham believed and it gave him hope. The first cause of hope, Dr. Packard says, is you believe the promise. The second one is you believe the one making the promise. You believe the one making the promises. Hope is only as good as the power and the character of the one making the promise. Did you hear that? Hope is only as good as the one making the promise. For example, um, maybe some of you, one of you, somebody of you would like to learn the French language. Well, you probably didn't know this, but my last name, Frazy, in French, they pronounce it Frazy because I am a Frenchman, which means that I am a great man at romance and I know the French language. <laughs> so if you would like to learn French, come hang out with me and I promise you will learn the French language by the end of the year. Any takers? Huh? You would be foolish to take me up on that. <laughs> because even though I am French, I do not know hardly anything about, the, oh, I do have croissant. But other than that, well, I have French toast. But other than that, I don't know the French language. So you could put your hope that you will learn the French language, but the one making the promise, he's got nothing. And this is very true. So you have to ask yourself, is Jesus really God? Does he have the capacity to deliver on the fantastic promise that he has made? This is where Palm Sunday comes in. For those of you who are new to church, I remember when I was, no one ever explained what these things were, you know? Palm Sunday is the inauguration of the most important week in human history. Palm Sunday is today, and it is the day Jesus does something very unique, something very specific, and it leads us in ultimately to Resurrection Sunday, which is next Sunday, most important week in human history. It's gonna help us here with hope. Matthew chapter 21, let me read the narrative to you. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them and he will send them right away. Now it's strange that um, the inauguration of the most important week in human history has the disciples going into the city of Jerusalem to fetch a couple of donkeys. Isn't that interesting? That is until you read the next verse. Verse four. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. And then Jesus is going to quote a prophet, an ancient prophet by the name of Zechariah. Say to daughter Zion, 
which is a fancy way of saying, say to Jerusalem, see your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey, on a coat, the foal of a donkey. 500 years earlier, the prophet Zechariah told us, you want to be look on the lookout for the one true Messiah, almighty God. And one of the things that will give you the signal that he is the right one is that he will ride into Jerusalem on a particular day on a donkey. When Jesus entered into Jerusalem that day on a donkey, it signaled, I am the one. I have the capacity and the power to deliver on everything I have promised you. Confidence rises. Hope rises. So let's keep reading. Verse six, the disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. Uh, they brought the donkey and the cold and placed the, their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road, the crowds uh, went ahead of him, and those that followed shouted. Okay, so here's the picture. Um, they, Jesus is on the donkey. He's riding into the city of Jerusalem. The streets are lined with people who take their cloaks and lay them out like red carpet for Jesus on the donkey to walk in. And they take palm branches, thus Palm Sunday, and they're waving them at Jesus as he enters, as, as his processional enters into the city of Jerusalem. And as they enter, they are shouting, Hosanna, which is just the Hebrew word for praise. Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, praise in the highest heaven. The people were lined the streets and they were shouting, they were quoting, they were singing. What? An ancient psalm. Psalm 118, verses 26, 25 and 26 that was written over a thousand years prior that basically refers to the one that God is going to bring to us that will save us from our enemies. When they shouted out this, they were declaring that Jesus is the one who will deliver them from their despair. Now, it's very likely that they thought he was going to deliver them from their temporal despair, from the enemy, the Roman government, who was humiliating them, but Jesus had something bigger in mind. It's called eternity. I have a good friend in San Antonio by the name of Morgan, uh, whose wife uh, of over 30 years on May the 5th, 2018, was diagnosed with a rare cancer. And the doctor didn't give them much hope. Um, they are both followers of Jesus, but she had a deep, deep belief and faith in Jesus. And Morgan had recently retired, and they have a very close relationship. And like me, they envisioned many years of doing life together. Morgan called me numerous times over last year and even this year's, weeping profusely over the even the thought of being separated from his wife, Susan. And uh, one of the things that Susan had envisioned for them in the future was for them to do a renewal of their vows on a beach with fireworks. With the help of the doctors and the gracious gift of their son, they created a magical experience of two people soaking up as much life as possible with the time that they had left. I just got back last night from doing Susan's memorial service. While there will be many tears for Morgan in the days to come as he adjusts to his new normal, the reality is when we gather together with 120 people, uh, we celebrated what is to come. Uh, and at the request of Morgan, we did not dress in black to mourn, but we all dressed in bright island colors like we were at the beach. And after, we, after I finished talking and we sang, it is well with my soul and how great thou art, uh, Morgan in his white linen island suit had us all go out into the backyard. And when we did, he released 12 doves. 
How do we deal with hardships and struggles in life? Here's our key idea. I want you to say it out loud with me, church. Ready? I can cope with the hardships in life because of the hope I have in Jesus Christ. Some of you right now may feel like you're down 18 runs and it's just the first inning. But in Jesus, he promises by the time you get to your ninth and final inning, you will be a winner. Jesus promises. The whole Palm Sunday narrative comes to a close with this verse. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, who is this? Who is this? I want you to close your eyes for just a second. And I want you to ask and answer that question. Who is this? And if your answer from the depths of your soul is that this is Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God, who was sent to us, prophesied thousands of years ago as the one true God, has come to offer up his life and to shed his perfect blood as a sacrifice for our sins, that if we were to dare to receive this forgiveness and receive and receive his love, that we would also receive the gift of eternal life and that everything that he has promised about what is yet ahead, in fact, will come about. And if that is true and you actually believe it, no matter what your circumstances are today, you don't need to ever live in a state of despair because Jesus has got you. And all of God's people said, amen, amen. I'm gonna ask you to stand to your feet. We're gonna have our prayer partners in the front here after the service. Uh, and there will also be prayer partners in our prayer room uh, uh, in the Lenexa campus. And I uh, wanna encourage you to take, uh, make yourself available to them. Also, I want you to know that also in your program, you receive this really cool little card. This is designed to give you information about this unfolding week, the most important week in human history, but it's also an invite card. You can take a picture of it or you can give it to somebody uh, to invite them to what's going to be an amazing experience. There's a number of things about the days that come, uh, but two specifically on Friday, uh, it's called in this week, it's called Good Friday. I think it's really interesting. The day that Jesus Christ is crucified on the cross we named Good Friday. Like, good for who? Answer, good for us. And so we're gonna have a wonderful a prayer journey experience here, and it starts at 6 a.m. You can come, bring your family, bring some friends, bring your kids. It's a great experience that you do at your own pace. And then on Saturday and Sunday, we're gonna have some awesome Easter services, and we're going to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who is the ultimate reason we have hope today. Amen? Now go into the world in peace. Have courage. Hold on to what is good. Honor all people. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the suffering and share the gospel. Love and serve the Lord in the power of the Holy Spirit. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Have a great day, church.